Hey, Gatsby here, asking you to pick two. No, instead of taking the low-hanging fruit of a copium make-a-wish to your ban list video, I want to go over a problem in the Yu-Gi-Oh! community I feel isn't discussed enough. Whether it's waiting literally 37 minutes for somebody to produce the least degenerate application of a Necroz combo ever caught in 4K, or an insane break my board that loses to the second evenly, feels like every few months we have a discussion on how the barrier to entry is Yu-Gi-Oh!'s biggest problem in the universe. Semi-recently, the Zeus Accessibility set was released for players interested in what 25 years of game development looked like. Naturally, the knee-jerk reaction from the community was, This is exactly why this game will never have new players. Why are cards like Ryu Ran being showcased next to Visa Starfrost and Eldlich the Golden Lord? You really think this product prepares somebody to sit across from somebody else playing Snake Eye Fire King? Well, in defense of Konami, to me, the product makes perfect sense. When you consider that the product is for people already interested in the property, it lines up with the expectation. Adding and matching star counts together could prove intimidating for somebody who was scared away from the game due to different colored cards. I think it's fair to expect most people to know about fusion summoning given that they were present in the anime from the start. I think sidelining link monsters and pendulums is a pretty good idea, because link arrows might be a bit much right out the gate, and I think Konami is still trying to actively get people to forget pendulum strategies even existed. I'd love to see a chapter 2 for advanced strategies where those are touched on, but for now this is fine. The journey from first pack to first place is such an insurmountable task to put on a single product it almost feels like it's being asked for in bad faith. And I am working on a video to help as a primer for new players unfamiliar with the game, so subscribe if you're interested in that, but the problem I want to talk about effects even players who play the game currently. Because at a fundamental level, I think that the vision Konami has for Yu-Gi-Oh! is not remotely close to the game that a lot of people believe it should be. So what does that even mean? Well, for those of you who aren't currently collecting social security, in the before times of pre-2005, gameplay was predominantly dictated by the use of powerful spells and traps to wildly influence the state of the game. If you ever watched or played any of the Yugi Kaiba format, first off, I'm sorry, but secondly, you might realize that the War of Attrition being checked by cards with 2000 defense was awful, and anyone telling you otherwise is either lying or needs professional help. This brings me to GOAT format, wherein the opinions of many core gameplay mechanics and fundamentals of early Yugi were perfected. The powerful spell traps that people came to loathe and love were put alongside a wider variety of effect monsters that the game was quickly becoming dependent on. But you already know what I gotta say because Edison format is peak Yu-Gi-Oh, baby! That's right, we got synchros, we got archetypes, you like Mirror Force, this format is- Oh, in a standby phase? God, I wish this game could have stayed closer to this, but Konami had something different in mind. 2014's Duelist Alliance is a popular set that many point to as the turning point of Yu-Gi-Oh, where the framework of modern play really began to take shape, and I'm inclined to agree. Despite being printed almost a decade prior, should all fusion redefined what an archetype fusion spell was allowed to read, being an undeniable blueprint for the 2022 branded strategy that still sees play today. Burning Abyss showed a very solid exceed strategy and to the day is still being used as a personality trait for a spinning fish salesman, and we even had a pendulum strategy in Clifford, introducing players to timeless lines like Towers Monsters, Pay 8 Feel Great, and Get That Shit Away From Me, I'm Not Reading A Fucking Pin. Prior to Duel Alliance, I feel that there's a different green booster set that I feel is the earliest example of the design philosophy present in the modern game. And I'm talking about December 2010 Hidden Arsenal 3 with the Dragoonity archetype. And before you say it, yes, Star Strike Blast had these two guys, but it doesn't count. Green boosters only. The gameplay loop was simple. Normal summon ducks with flanks in grave. Ducks target flanks. Flanks effect. Synchro Vajrayana. Repeat. End on a level 8. Three months later, this line was made even more consistent with a structure deck where we got Akles, Mistletane, Levitin, and most importantly, one of, if not the most impactful field spell at the time, Dragon's Ravine. A soft once per turn to discard and add either a level 4 Lower Dragoonity or send a dragon from the deck to the grave. A modular field spell to ramp consistency by means of fixing your hands, searching your cards, or simply setting up your graveyards in 2011. Did it break the format? Well, no, that's for later. But looking back in my humble fact-providing opinion, this is one of the first times we'd ever seen anything like it. An archetype with combo lines that the deck's identity would revolve around made consistent via in-archetype search pieces. And if you're in your chair screaming, no, it's Black Wings, Light Swords, Glad Beasts, or Six Samurai, I think Dragoonity is the best example here, but you're more than welcome to pill me in the comment section on how the design philosophy behind XE Dragon Cannon is the one true archetype blueprint. 
The gameplay elements present in Dragoonity with the advancements and consistency would continue to be built upon in things like Insectors and Windups in Order of Chaos, the Fire Water format of Cosmo Blazer, Dragon Rulers of Lord of the Tachyon Galaxy, and of course Hidden Arsenal 7's Constellars and Evil Swarms, just to name a few. Each deck revolved around finding the most consistent manner to end on the preferred game state in a way not seen in decks prior to 2011, which did lead some players to go play Vanguard for a little bit. But the point was that each strategy solidified what set Yu-Gi-Oh apart from other card games on the market. A fast-paced combo game limited only by the cards in the hands of the pilot. Now let's briefly move away from paper so that I can attempt to business expense my spending on Duel Links. When given the opportunity to remake Yu-Gi-Oh from the ground up, Duel Links started with a similar design philosophy. Cards like Blade Knight and Flash Assailant, backed by consistency skills like Balance, commanded a chunk of the game's early life. And over time, we would continue to see those skills grow alongside sets released until we hit a critical mass of what a skill was allowed to do. All but playing the game for you. If you built the deck with the requirements of the skill, 9 out of 10 times you're going to get that desired combo each time you sit down. And stay focused, the development of skills, whether if it's a good thing or a bad thing for Duel Links, maybe that's for 2024's tax season. But for the point of this video, it showed a conscious decision to provide players with consistent access to lines of play. And that design choice, for better or worse, I believe, is Konami's vision for Yu-Gi-Oh! as a whole. The modern game has no shortage of things to complain about. Decks feel like they need at least 9 one-card starters to be even considered viable, and losing a single turn to bricking could lose you a game right on the spot. When there are fewer steps to learning how to waltz than the average Manadium combo, it's easy to see how the complexity can turn players away from the game. But it is in service to the desired consistency that Konami has shown to push for. There is a weird mysticism around the game prior to the archetype-style deck building that makes up the majority of the last 10 years, that makes people unable or unwilling to see why the game game needed to change. And despite what they believe, the playground meta that never was might sound great on paper, but try not to ask your parents how much they spent on a mechanical chaser. I understand the complexity of even the most simple decks makes the game difficult to approach for newer players. And as I previously mentioned, I intend on working on some videos to help break down ways to approach the game differently in an effort to not overwhelm these newer players. Because even though I enjoy the game, I can't say I love everything about it. But post Power of the Elements, I think the game is really hitting its stride. We're seeing more strategies opt for a better mid-range grind game with things like a 70-30 split becoming more common. With flex spots from lighter engines allowing players to sight in a wider selection of tech options and allow skill expression, break my board strategies are less likely to pop all the way off. When Cash Tira was a premier tier 1 meta threat with a Rise Heart, he could attempt to 10 zone lock somebody. But the hand trap game of Do They Have It had an entire chunk of the player base navigating suboptimal lines to play around Schrodinger's Nibiru. Even now in the current tier 0 we have cards like Lullaby of Obedience making the rounds again as a choice tech card for the expected mirror matches. Ultimately what I'm asking for is that people put away the rose tinted glasses and acknowledge that this is not your grandfather's Yu-Gi-Oh. I mean, unless you're gonna go play it. If you're trying to learn how to play, I'd suggest Master Duel as you can easily build one to two decks on a free to play account. This allows you to take full advantage of the training wheels of activation windows being handled to ease you into the game. If you decide that you wanna misplay with the rest of us in paper, picking up a rogue deck and learning the bread and butter basics can be relatively cheap. And as previously mentioned, I will be working on a video to help as a prime but many folks in the Yu-Gi-Oh community are usually willing to help out a newer player, especially if it is to get them into their favorite sunken cost fallacy. But whichever method you choose, just remember to have fun with it because I'm coming to kill you all in Los Angeles at your house! Or in the ring. No, in real life! <laughs>